Hi, Linda. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 6 of the Front Porch Book Club. The Front Porch Book Club is a podcast that meets twice a month. And we like to dig deep into the relationship between characters and the worlds they live in. Grab your book and iced tea and join us on the front porch. Today, we interview Dr. Don Will Height from the University of Nebraska Lincoln about this blessed earth. He is quoted throughout this book, particularly in the sections about irrigation. This blessed earth was by investigative journalist Ted Genoways. This will be so exciting to talk to the individual who really provided so much information about the importance of water in agriculture, drought, and climate change. I know. I have a lot of questions for him, so (laughs) (laughs) it's good we're having him. So let's get to it, Nance. All right. (laughs) Our guest today is Dr. Don Wilhite. He is Professor, Director Emeritus of Applied Climate Science in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and he's one of the world's most widely respected authorities on drought monitoring and management. He founded the National Drought Mitigation Center and the International Drought Information Center. Over his career, he's worked with many federal and state agencies, foreign governments, and international and regional organizations on a broad range of drought management issues. He's published 150 journal articles, monographs, book chapters, and technical reports. And two of Dr. Will Height's most recent books are Drought and Water Crises, Integrating Science Management and Policy. That's the second edition of that book and a new version of the Atlas of Nebraska. Thank you, Don, for joining us today. My pleasure. You have devoted your career to climate, science, and water. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this area? Good question. (laughs) My training is in the broad area of geography, and um, I have a subspecialty in the climate science area. But I think, you know, the training in geography gives one a very broad perspective of both the physical as well as social sciences. With that sort of background, I became interested, particularly at the master's level, which I was uh, doing my master's from Arizona State University. And so I became very interested in climate variability and climate science, in particular, obviously being in Arizona, we're in the middle of a desert, but also an area where there's quite a bit of variation in the climate from north to south. And so my master's thesis was really focusing on the variability historically of climate in the state of Arizona. And then when I continued my graduate work at the University of Nebraska later, I became very interested in drought and the impacts of drought in Nebraska, but also more broadly throughout the Great Plains and internationally. And so while my interest initially was more in the climatology of drought, The more I studied drought, and particularly when I started my research program, I became very interested in the management aspects of drought and also the policy implications and how governments were dealing with or not dealing with severe drought episodes, not only in the U.S., but around the world. That sort of launched my career, so I've really worked a lot globally as well as nationally on the drought issue, covering the broad range, everything from drought monitoring through management planning policy and working with UN organizations and countries and so on. What led to your founding of the National Drought Mitigation Center and the International Drought Information Center? Well, as I pursued my research program, focusing on not just the climatology of drought, but the management and the policy implications, I organized an international symposium and workshop at the University of Nebraska in 1986. And I was very curious about why governments of the world, not just the U.S. government, but why governments of the world uh, were not preparing for or responding effectively to drought episodes. Because drought's a normal part of the climate, so it shouldn't be taking governments by surprise. They should realize that droughts are going to recur in the future like they have in the past. And the fact that they were not preparing for those seemed to be a sort of a a disconnect to me. And so 
I organized this international symposium and workshop following an evaluation of the U.S. government's response to the drought of the mid-70s, in which I looked at not just the federal response to the drought, but also how various states in the Great Plains had responded to drought, whether they had prepared for it. So this international symposium and workshop really brought together scientists and policymakers from throughout the world to really talk about not just the science of drought, but why we were not doing a better job of dealing with something that is a recurring part of our climate. That symposium actually turned out to generate a research roadmap, not just for myself, but I think the entire drought community looked at what had come out of that, what we saw as the shortcomings, and as a result, became this sort of pathway forward in terms of how various researchers, not just in the U.S., but around the world, were going to deal with drought in the future. So that's what launched the International Drought Information Center. Then that led to the, the formation of the National Drought Mitigation Center because of a project that I did with support from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in which a part of that project was to come up with some potential new federal initiatives that could be supported that would help to advance sort of the science of drought and drought management. And so one of those recommendations that I made coming out of that project was that the United States needed to develop a drought early warning system, which was not in effect at the time. And drought is such a different natural hazard because of its slow onset that it's a very complex process to actually monitor its evolution. And so you don't just look at precipitation. You have to be monitoring, for example, reservoir levels, snowpack, stream flow, soil moisture, groundwater levels, vegetation stress, all of these things, plus the various kinds of impacts that occur from drought. I recommended that the U.S. establish a more comprehensive early warning system And the other recommendation I made was that the U.S. really needed to establish a national drought mitigation center that would focus on preparedness and mitigating the impacts of drought through preparedness planning. And fortunately, I was able to uh, get the attention of then Governor Bob Carey. I had worked with Governor Carey to develop Nebraska's first drought plan. So he was very aware of the type of work that I was doing. And so when I approached him and I said, I think we need a national drought mitigation center, and I'd like to have that formed at the University of Nebraska because we had become known kind of as drought central in the world. So he was able to uh, get some money through the earmark process to actually launch the drought center. Here we are 26 years later, and the drought center is just going gangbusters. Yeah, it's such a legacy. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of the National Drought Mitigation Center? I know they actually do the drought monitoring now. What's their mission and also the mission of the International Drought Information Center? Right. Well, when the National Drought Mitigation Center was formed, I had to make a decision as to um, what to do with the International Drought Information Center. And given the fact that my funding for the Drought Mitigation Center was coming from Congress, I thought it would not be appropriate to call it the International Drought Mitigation Center. One of the things that intrigued uh, then-Senator Kerry was the fact that we were going to focus on national issues related to drought, not just on Nebraska. So that gave him a lot stronger rationale to uh, come up with the money to get get the drought center started. We launched the drought mitigation center and the the international drought information center was just folded underneath the national drought mitigation center. So I would say over the years since it was formed, probably 40 to 50 percent of the work that the national drought mitigation center does is actually focused on the global arena, working with foreign governments, working with United Nations agencies, regional organizations, and so on. So the focus of the the program from the very beginning was to cover the entire breadth of research topics associated with drought, everything from the monitoring early warning side, which is really 
kind of the foundation of improved management all the way through impact assessment, mitigation, response, and policy. That became the, the mission of the National Drought Mitigation Center in 1995 when it was established, and it remains the mission of the Drought Center today. You have all of this information. How does that funnel down to the farmer in Nebraska? There are several different mechanisms. People used to ask me because of the fact that I spent probably half of my waking hours overseas, uh, working with other governments and international organizations. You know, sometimes people would say, well, how does that, how does that benefit Nebraska? Well, it benefits Nebraska for one thing, it builds visibility for the drought center and the university. So that's a very positive thing. Also, we're promoting ideas from the U.S. to other countries, but we're also learning about what other countries are doing, either correctly or incorrectly with regards to drought. So those lessons learned are lessons that we bring back to the U.S. to help us deal more effectively with drought here. And drought affects so many different sectors. We, I think, quite naturally think of drought as primarily maybe focusing on agricultural impacts. Mm -hmm. And agriculture is normally the first sector that's affected by drought, but it's certainly not the only sector. And one of the things that we've seen over the last decade or two is the fact that drought now is affecting so many other different sectors, recreation, tourism, energy demand, hydroelectric power production. I mean, you just name it, the list just goes on and on and on. And so it's important that the information that we provide, including through the U.S. Drought Monitor, that this information is packaged in such a way that it gets to a wide range of different users, including the the farming community. U.S. Drought Monitor is actually a joint effort between the U.S. Department of Agriculture because they're very interested in in how this information flows to the farming community and ranching community, but they're also uh, very interested in how it gets to other segments of the population. So NOAA, or National Weather Service Organization, they are also a part of this three-way linkage that produces the U.S. Drought Monitor on a weekly basis and has done that every week since August of 1999. So it's a huge effort. It is now the drought monitoring standard for every place in the world. We're fortunate in the United States that we have so much data that's available that helps us monitor drought very effectively. And this data is all all freely available through the internet. And unfortunately, in a lot of countries, number one, they don't have a lot of data available. And what they do have available is oftentimes available only at a price. You have to buy it from the various agencies that collect it. So even though you may be trying to develop a drought monitoring tool for Brazil, for example, the data is not freely available to all the participating organizations. Unless you have these cooperative agreements to develop, It's hard to develop these kind of integrated drought monitoring tools. A big part of Ted's book was on drought and water management and things that I didn't know anything about, including this aquifer and farmers digging down to pull the water up and irrigation. One of the interesting things that I learned was this pivot irrigation system. Right. Can you explain that? And then I want you to comment on this very fascinating piece about a water droplet that goes shooting up in the air from the irrigation. And some scientists has figured out how much of that water droplet evaporates until it gets to the soil. Well, the center pivot irrigation platform was actually invented in Nebraska. And Is so, that right? I didn't. Yeah. You guys are really on the cutting edge of <laughs> A lot of stuff out there in Nebraska. (laughs) That's right. right. Yeah, the center pivot irrigation system is an interesting one. Previous irrigation was furrow irrigation where you're pumping water out of a stream or it could be groundwater as well. And it's just pumped into the rows between the plants and it just flows down the rows and it irrigates. 
the center pivot irrigation system, how that revolutionized uh, irrigation initially in the Great Plains, including Nebraska, was the fact that a lot of the landscape in the Great Plains is, a lot of it is flat, but there's also landscape where you have sort of rolling hills. And these center pivot systems actually allow you to run these pivot systems so they go up and up hills and down in the valleys. And so they can work better on slopes, which obviously wouldn't work if you're doing furrow irrigation. Furrow irrigation is obviously on very flat land. Okay. So uh, the center pivot irrigation system, which largely relies on pumping groundwater, was something that really revolutionized irrigation in Nebraska, but also irrigation in, in large portions of the Great Plains. These center pivot systems, getting back to your question about evaporation and all of that, these initial center pivot irrigation systems were just spraying water up into the air as they rotated and moved around a field. And so a lot of that water, just like if you're watering your lawn and you're throwing water up into the air on a hot summer day where there's wind, a lot of that water is going to evaporate or it's going to blow and not land necessarily where you want it to land, mm -hmm. which is on your lawn or on, on a crop. As the center pivot irrigation systems have evolved, they've become much more water user friendly and uh, much more water efficient and water conserving. And so now if you see the center pivot irrigation system, for the most part, at least the the more modern systems are not spraying water in the air, but they have tubes that come down from the central platform and they're actually spraying water right down on top of the plant. And so these tubes are running down maybe three feet or so from the top of the pivot system down. And, and so there's much less water going up into the air, much less evaporation. It, it's a much more water conserving technology now. The issue with regards to irrigation in the Great Plains, whether it's center pivot or whether it's uh, furrow irrigation or some other kind of irrigation, is the fact that within the High Plains Aquifer, which runs from Texas, western Texas, up through Nebraska, including eastern Colorado and eastern New Mexico, or western Kansas and western Oklahoma, and it just touches the border of the southern border of South Dakota. The water in, in this aquifer system in Nebraska actually gets recharged. There is recharge that's occurring. And so when we have a bad drought year like we had in 2012, uh, in subsequent years that, where we had above normal precipitation, we've actually recharged the aquifer in Nebraska. However, in Texas and western Kansas and eastern Colorado and eastern New Mexico and so on, that is very much what we refer to as fossil water. That is water that, that is part of an aquifer system that it's, it's quite deep and it's not being recharged. And so the water that they started pumping out of that aquifer in the 30s and 40s has not been replenished. And so they've been gradually drawing the, the water table down lower and lower. And the lower it goes in order to pump that water to the surface, it takes more and more energy. And the energy is expensive. A lot of the aquifer in the southern part of the Great Plains is pretty much depleted. There's not a lot of water left. And what's there is very expensive to pump. Whereas Nebraska, there's a lot more water that remains in the aquifer. And that is the purpose of the natural resource districts. The purpose of the nat natural resource districts when they were formed was to manage that groundwater resource. When they get into a situation where there's a huge drawdown of the aquifer, the natural resources districts actually have the authority to create groundwater management areas. They can legislate the amount of water that farmers can pump in any particular growing season. And so this has happened in Southwest Nebraska, for example, where farmers, the maximum amount of water they can pump 
is like 39 inches over a three year period. And so if they wanna pump 24 inches in year one, this only leaves them with 15 inches for year two and year three. So they've got to be careful on how they pump that resource and how they couple that with the climate. We may have a drought year in year one, but there's no guarantee that we're not going to have a drought year in year two and year three because droughts in the Great Plains can last multiple years. And you just think back to the 1930s and the Dust Bowl where it we went for almost a decade. You're on a tightrope here as to managing that water resource when your area has been declared a, a groundwater management area. Uh, if it's not, then you're allowed to pump. Uh, in most cases, you're not restricted in how much water you pump as long as the water is there. But that can create problems with neighboring wells, domestic wells, and so on, because you can pump the water down so all of a sudden domestic wells begin to dry up. That has repercussions, obviously, policy repercussions and lawsuits. And that NRD system that Nebraska has, that's really unique in the United States. That really was a reaction to making sure that the water from the High Plains aquifer would be available for coming generations. Exactly. That is uh, something that is unique to Nebraska more states really should be following that model. I think it's been quite successful. Now, the natural resources districts have their limitations. And they have the authority to tax. But if you have very few people that live in a particular county or a particular area, there's not much of a tax base there. Natural resources districts that exist in eastern Nebraska, where you have Omaha and Lincoln and Grand Island and more population centers, they have more resources available. That's a bit of a problem for some of the resource districts that exist in the western part of Nebraska. I was at a uh, climate forum uh, about five or six years ago. There was a session on drought and drought management. And one of the people from California said, uh, what can California do? Because they were in the middle of a five, six year drought. You know, what can California do? And they're still in the middle of a drought, by the yeah. way. Um, oh. You know, I said, well, one of the things you can do is you can learn from the lessons of other states. For example, natural resources districts in Nebraska have been very effective in trying to control pumping from the aquifer. California has a tendency to think that they've already learned all the lessons and, and nobody else, you know, can measure up to what they do. <laughs> It's hard for California sometimes to think that they can actually learn from Nebraska or Montana or Kansas or whatever. So what are some actions that everyday people can take to mitigate drought or conserve our water resources? At a larger scale management policy level, you know, the things that I've talked about partially here when I work with uh, foreign governments, for example, or with states in the United States, encourage them to develop drought plans. And I might just add, when I started working with states in the U.S., we had three states with drought plans. Now we have 47. Wow. So there's been a tremendous movement, and about a third of the states with drought plans are actually following a more proactive mitigation approach rather than just a reactive approach. You know, when you get into a drought, that's when you do something. Right. When you get into a drought, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Your only option is what we refer to as crisis management. You're trying to deal with an emergency. At the, the policy or management level, what we've been promoting internationally, and a lot of that is based upon a 10-step planning process that I developed to help states develop drought plans in the U.S. to provide them with a tool or a methodology to develop it. The states would say, well, I understand I should plan for drought, but how do I do it? So I put together this 10-step planning process, which then I modified in 2014 to help countries of the world develop national drought management policies. And so that's also a 10-step process. There are three main pillars to that process. One is monitoring early warning system because you have to have good information. You have to understand how severe the drought is, how it's evolving, which sectors are being affected, and 
That's the first pillar. The second pillar is having tools available so that you can assess rapidly what the impacts are likely to be. And then also part of that second pillar to do what we refer to as vulnerability assessments. If you know where you're vulnerable, which you do from learning where your impacts have occurred from recent droughts, this tells you which sectors are the most vulnerable. And then the third pillar is you develop mitigation actions and response programs that address those risks or those vulnerabilities so that the next drought, you're not as vulnerable. So that's kind of at the, at the larger scale. But you can also, you can downscale that to individuals. Obviously, water conservation is a huge tool that communities have and individuals have in terms of reducing the amount of water that they use. You know, we hear a lot about reducing your carbon footprint with regards to climate change, where you can reduce your water footprint as well through improved management, water-saving appliances in your home, and so on. One of the things we've done for the farm community within the Drought Mitigation Center, we've taken this 10-step planning process, and we work with ranchers, particularly throughout the Great Plains, but this has been applied outside of the Great Plains as well, encouraging ranchers to develop their own drought plans for how they're going to deal with drought in terms of what they're going to do with their, their stocking numbers, how they're going to move those stocking numbers around their property when they get into a drought situation. It's expensive to destock. You know, if you just start selling off your herd, that's one way to deal with the drought, but then you've got the cost of trying to build the herd back up. And so if you can improve management where you don't have to reduce the number of livestock that you have as dramatically, that's a good management tool. With farmers, you're in situations where you may be advised to not only plant more drought-resistant varieties of corn, for example, but also to switch to more drought-resistant crops. One huge thing that farmers can do, not only in dealing with drought, but also with climate change, is an area now that's referred to as soil health. If you can build up the organic matter in your soil, the soil retains more moisture, and no-till agriculture is one way to do this. Leaving stubble mulch on the surface reduces erosion. More water goes into the soil. If you plant cover crops, you can build up nitrogen in the soil, so you have to use less fertilizer. Economically, that's a very good thing, but it also, as you build up soil health, you are sequestering carbon in the soil, you're retaining more moisture, and that helps you withstand a drought episode. There are all kinds of tools that can be used. And so it's important that people like myself and other sort of drought scientists work with agronomists, work with soil scientists, work with livestock managers, animal scientists, and so on. So we create a um, more integrated approach to how we manage. Because one of the things that's going to occur with climate change, and we're already seeing this in large parts of the world, is we're going to see droughts become more frequent, more severe, and probably of longer duration. It's critical that, that the agricultural community begins to adapt to that change in the climate. Well, I like the way you talked about individual users too, because I really liked this book. And then when it got to the water management, it was kind of frightening because yeah. I did not realize that there was an aquifer, what it was, mm -hmm. and that we were using it up and yeah. that this had to be managed and the soil and all of this stuff. It was actually alarming to me. So listening to you, the work that you're doing, the work that the university and all of these groups are doing to look at this issue has settled me down a little bit from the, the <laughs> alarmist state that I was in reading this book because it was scary to me. I haven't really thought about it. We don't have that many droughts here in the Northeast. Yeah, we don't we don't want you to have an anxiety attack. Well, there there was some anxiety reading this book, like, well, what's going on out there? So I'm glad that there's people working on this. There are a lot of people working on it. What's the takeaway or any books that people can read 
that want to know more about this topic? One thing that people can do if they want to learn more about the drought issue uh, is if they go to the National Drought Mitigation Center's website, which okay. is a, an excellent website where it talks about a lot of these different tools and the Drought Center's website is just drought.unl.edu. Okay. Also, the Drought Center is working very closely with the Dartery Water for Food Institute that was established, oh gosh, how long has it been now? Maybe eight years ago. And they're working on a lot of these related issues. Their basic theme is how do we produce more crops, more food with less water? Right. That's a challenge that we have everywhere in the world. We've got an expanding population. We're already at like 7.8 billion. We're headed towards close to 10 billion by 2050. And if you look at the number of people that are already malnourished, we've got to become more efficient in our food production. We have to produce more food, but we have to do a better job of not only wasting less food, but also using less water. Uh, the Daughtery Water for Food Institute is working on that with a lot of other organizations like the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and many other organizations around the world. Well, thank you for everything that you're doing because I want to be able to eat in five and ten years. <laughs> so I appreciate all your hard work on this. It's a scary situation. You know, not only are we concerned about droughts in the future and increasing frequency of droughts, but, you know, this issue of a changing climate and how that's going to affect variability and the occurrence of extreme events is really, really a concern for the future. Right. Drought is a part of that, but also flooding is a part of that, increased numbers of hurricanes, typhoons. It's a very complicated future, and so we, we need to be grabbing a hold of that uh, now because the longer we wait, the more difficult it's going to be. Fortunately, there's a lot of research going on. I think we're moving in the right direction. We just need to move faster. I know that you are officially retired from the university, although you're remaining very active. Can you tell us what's coming up next for you? Several main things that I'm involved with. In the latter years of my university work, I became engaged very heavily in this whole issue of climate change. In uh, 2014, we produced an assessment of climate change for the state of Nebraska. That got a lot of positive results. We have not quite been successful in getting the state to develop a climate action plan, but we've had bills before the legislature, I think, in the last five or six legislative sessions. Uh, I'm also working with a group, we call ourselves the Elder Climate Legacy Group. We've been working with the legislature on legislation. We've been uh, working to uh, increase awareness and education on the climate change issue. I do a lot of lectures on climate change. We're reaching out on this climate change issue to the faith community. Yeah. In addition to the climate change stuff, I'm also continuing to dabble in the drought stuff. So I'm currently coordinating a project for uh, six countries in Southern South America uh, to develop national drought policies. So I'm doing that. I'm working with Brazil. I'm continuing to work with the World Meteorological Organization. And I'm keeping busy, but uh, not too busy because <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> Where Where's the best way people can stay in touch with you and what you're working on? Do you have like a website or? The best way to do that is actually uh, primarily through email, which is just dwellheight2 at unl.edu. We had this climate action plan bill before the legislature this last year, and we got both the editorial board of the Omaha World Herald and the Lincoln Journal Star to tell the legislature they needed to pass this bill. Unfortunately, it hasn't done any good because we have a very conservative legislature and governor, but we're, we're going to keep at it. The pressure's on. Great. That's good news. Thank you so much for all of the work you're doing around drought, but also really addressing the important issue of climate change. We appreciate the time you've taken to join us here on the front porch and help us learn more about these issues, Don. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you nice so much. Nice to meet both of you, Linda and Nancy. Oh, nice to meet you, <laughs> yeah. too. Thank you so much. You're welcome. 
Well, Nancy, I'm glad that he's working on this. Um, (laughs) There's a lot to this water issue. It is complex. It is important. And I think at this point, we can't take water for granted anymore. We need to get serious about this. And, And I learned a lot from him today. I love how he talked about working at the individual level, what we as individuals can do, what producers can do, producers in agriculture, what's happening at the regional and state levels, what's happening at the federal level, and even the work that is being done with other governments. You know, we are all affected by drought and changing climate. So it makes me feel like there's a path forward for us in this issue. It does. And that does make me feel good. And what happens in Nebraska affects all of us. And what happens in Africa and droughts there affect all of us. Um, We are all connected on this planet. I'm very grateful for the work that he's doing and the other people that he is working on with this issue. Absolutely. Well, next time on the front porch, we will review where the crawdads sing written by Delia Owens. And if you haven't read it, pick it up. I'm a big fan of the book. You can get in touch with us by going to our website at frontporchbookclub.com. You can post comments, make suggestions for books for us to discuss, and you can check out what we'll be discussing in the future so you can start reading now. So you'll want to read this book. You can post questions you'd like us to ask for our upcoming Front Porch visitors. Just a reminder, our episodes come out twice a month. Every month we pick a book. Our first episode is you and me talking about the book. And the second episode is talking to the author or some expert. So if you like the show, be sure to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And I don't know, tell a friend too. Bring everybody to our front porch. (laughs) (laughs) There's room for everyone. Yep. (laughs) Hey, Nancy, I'll see you next time. Sounds great. Bye-bye, Lenny. Bye. (laughs) 